Um, I have uh, links here to some of the resources that you may have heard about from us before, our model code, our community not cops campaign, solutions not suspensions campaign, and our restorative and transformative justice toolkit. We are going to share in the chat a few times during the presentation, the PDF of this presentation. So all of these links are live um, and you can reference it later as well. These are our speakers today. I'm speaking right now. I'm Natalie Chapp from the Dignity in Schools campaign. We have Harold Jart Jordan from the ACLU of Pennsylvania, Sarah LaCour and Dan Lawson from the National Center for Youth Law. And just for, for your reference, DSC Decodes is actually a larger political education and capacity building series for our members and allies that we've been doing between 2023 and 2024. And the purpose to is to expand our conversations to thinking beyond the education system about how all systems of oppression interact at this particular moment in time. Accessing data is a topic we've covered before in a more um, just skills-based uh, conversation. So here we're also talking about it in a broader way as well, thinking about um, data in general and some of the gaps that have been coming up. So our agenda for today, uh, first we're gonna go over why discipline and climate data is important, the problems with the recent civil rights data collection release, um, other ways that you can access data given that. Um, and we hope to have a good amount of time for discussion um, and Q&A. We have questions for you. You'll probably have questions for us. You can go ahead and put some questions in the chat if you wanna keep track of them, we can look back, um, but we probably are not going to pause the discussion so we can keep things moving. So you can either you know, type your question in the chat, we'll get to it later um, or keep it to yourself until that Q&A time. And so just to, to let you know what some of the key points that we're trying to get home um, over the course of this webinar is that access to discipline and climate data is critical. The most recent data release is very flawed. There are other ways to access similar data. And this is an additional burden on um, organizers and advocates to have to do some of these additional things. Um, so again, just to start off with why discipline and climate data is important. So just to step back and think about data and um, organizing campaigns, a central question is how can you convince decision makers that there is a problem and that something needs to change? In most cases, just showing data demonstrating that there is a problem is not enough. We know this. Individual stories can deepen the understanding of the impact of a problem, but often can't show that the issue is impacting large numbers of people. So organizing can bring together individual stories and data with the power of a community to hold decision makers accountable, and that can lead to lasting and meaningful change. So I mentioned it before, the civil rights data collection. Um, comes out of the US Department of Education. They gather data from all public schools on a bunch of different civil rights issues in education. That includes rates of student suspensions, expulsions, and arrests. And that's what we often look at as CSC, along with some of the other um, areas as well. It is only collected every other year. Um, and there is, at this point, a several year gap between collection of the data and when it's actually released. Um, and for a long time, it, part of why this is really important, for a long time, many states, this was the only way to access this data. Um, some states have always had, you know, ways on, on their websites and things that they share it, but a lot of states really didn't. They've gotten better over the years. Um, so we've always held a similar webinar to this each year that there has been a release because so many of our members have found um, successful ways to use this specific data in their local campaigns and advocacy. Um, and again, you know, we really do think it is a problem um, that we're going to have several years without access to this data that's uh, usable in the way that we've had in the past. 
Um, and I wanted to give one example of how it has been used. So this is a historical example way back to 2011, 2012, um, civil rights data collection. That was the first year that they gathered data on the rates of pre-K school discipline, like suspensions and expulsions, disaggregated by race and gender. This, and so that was when the actual collection was, they didn't make the data available to the public until 2014. And it showed some really devastating statistics, including that Black children represented 18% of preschool enrollment, but 48% of preschool children receiving more than one out-of-school suspension. And they, the, when they released, this is actually a screenshot of the actual document um, highlighting different um, data that was found. They actually let the first thing um, that the Department of the Office for Civil Rights um, led with on their fact sheet was this data around um, suspensions in preschool. And so following that, like I said, that was around uh, 2014, there was a lot of attention given to this issue. So of course, organizers and advocates had been seeing this for a long time. They didn't need the data to know that it was a problem. But now that it was being released on the national level, it was getting media attention, um, more decision makers were um, paying attention to it. And there were several campaigns that were um, successful that were called, um, a lot of them used the, the slogan, too young to suspend. Um, and so by 2019, 14 states had passed some kind of restriction on suspensions or expulsions for younger grades. And at least 10 of the larger school districts um, had um, policies that were enacted. You can find that um, on a fact sheet out of zero tolerance, um, which we have linked to a few times in here. So just wanted to give an example of how access to data through the civil rights data collection was able to support um, local grassroots organizing to actually see um, some policy change and meaningful change at the school level. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Harold Jordan of the ACLU of Pennsylvania to talk a little bit more about the civil rights data collection um, and the most recent release. So I'm gonna pass it to Harold now. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Um, based, I'm with the ACLU of Pennsylvania. We are longtime proud members of the Dignity in Schools campaign and have been involved in many of the sort of products and campaigns that Natalie mentioned at the beginning. Um, let's dig into the civil rights data collection. As Natalie mentioned, um, it is normally issued, uh, released every other year. Uh, but the important thing to know is that uh, there was a big gap because Secretary DeVos decided to skip the 2019 and 2020 collection. And so for the first time, school, schools are asked to submit data for two years back to back. The 2020-2021 school year, that data was released in November of 2023, and the 2021-22 school year, which is being collected now. And our colleagues at the National Center for Youth Law will talk a little bit more about the data that is being collected now and what advocates and activists should be doing to get a hold of that data. But this means that there is a big data gap in reporting between 2017 and 2020. Um, and the data that is reported is for COVID year where schools were closed off and on for much of the year, except in Florida. Um, in November of 2023, the, the Office of Civil Rights did release the CRDC for that uh, COVID year. Uh, they also moved everything to a new website called civilrightsdata.ed.gov. And it's nice, it's beautiful, it's user-friendly, uh, but it doesn't have all of the tools that the, that the earlier website did. And in particular, it does not have the analytical tools that allow you to look at uh, sort of cross-cutting measures, such as the experience of someone who's in a certain racial ethnic group, gender, disability, et cetera. Um, and so it is not as flexible as the old site was, but it's actually in some ways more user-friendly. In addition, 
uh, the department also posted some snaps, some data snapshots of the nationwide data. Now, even that includes even places where the data is missing, but it's the nationwide data that was available to the Department of Ed. Um, but those snapshots cover discipline, law enforcement, sex-based violence, uh, and enrollment trends, and they're worth looking at. So that's in the publication section of the website. So why are we talking about 2021 data if the data is so flawed? I mean, the data exists and it is a reality. It, the media will see it, uh, school districts will see it. So we wanna walk you through sort of how to look. We wanna kind of walk you through the data, talk about what the problems are, how to use it, how not to use it. Well, Office of Civil Rights released the data as normal, but there weren't enough clear warnings on the site about the problem. There were some warnings in the snapshot reports, but generally speaking, you don't get enough warnings on the site about the data and the limitations of using the data. But they released the data that they had, uh, and they released the data that they felt comfortable uh, releasing. So as we know, school districts may point to the data as activists in this area know and say, wow, these trends are declining over time, things are getting better, but we have to sort of hold their feet to the fire in this to say, well, this may not be representative of what normally happens and what has happened since COVID. Um, at the same time, we do know that the non-discipline data, in other words, the data on sort of academic measures, opportunity measures, um, is more complete. And it may tell you something about patterns of inequity within a school district. And so that is generally for the use of it. But sometimes we find that when we have access to other data, non-CRDC data, that we see trends. And I'm gonna pull an example here from my home state of Pennsylvania, where in Erie, when we looked at uh, the court system data, we found that school police were still issuing truancy tickets to kids. And in fact, at increasing numbers, uh, during that, during the period of COVID. So that's something that we know using non-CRDC data. Uh, and it's important to use any other data that we have access to the document tricks. But school district police were actually issuing truancy tickets to kids, even when they were virtual or learning. Uh, and we also need to be clear with the media about the, the strengths and limitations of the data. But we want advocates to have access to, to, to this information and to know all of the nuances. So let's dig in a little bit and look at some or share some observations. The discipline data generally is very incomplete. We are missing data, true zeros. Uh, that is where they, the, the, the school district provides a zero as opposed to a non-answer to a question. And what the Department of Ed refers to as data quality issues. And that means where Data was turned in, but the department had some questions about whether uh, the data was accurate or adequate, uh, and so chose not to report the data. Um, as we know, many schools were closed off and on, but even in places like Florida, which was open, where schools were open much of the year, the data is incomplete, and we'll take a look at that in just a minute. Uh, we looked carefully at the 10 largest, in fact, I looked at the 20 largest districts in the country, which we'll, we'll see in just a minute, and for none of them was the discipline data posted. Um, in general, we found that the number of law enforcement officers is understated, and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, many of the positions were not filled while buildings were closed. Um, so in some cases, especially when districts had school resource officer arrangements, uh, the positions were sort of temporarily reassigned back to the police departments. Um, however, what we have noticed since then, uh, since schools have reopened, that these positions have been subsequently filled. Um, but that's a limitation of the data. And generally, the academic data is complete including staffing levels, who takes algebra, AP courses, retention and enrollment, access to internet devices, uh, and certified teachers. And that's important to look at when we're making an argument about equality, um, equity, and the lack of equity, you know, inequity in schools. Taking a close look at the 10 largest districts in the country, we were struck by just the missing data when it comes to school discipline and school climate. And we see that in none of those 10 
largest districts worth of data available. That means things like uh, arrests, referrals to law enforcement, seclusion and restraint, out of school suspensions, et cetera. And this is for millions of children. Nonetheless, the department uh, did produce some narrative reports based on the data that was available. So what should advocates and others conclude from this? One, it makes no sense to, to make comparisons across the year. In other words, if you're comparing, do not compare 2021 data to 2017 data. Um, it makes no, no sense to do that. You're not gonna come up with an, an accurate measure of what actually happened during that school year, including the COVID-related discipline that did happen. Um, as I said earlier, the academic data, in other words, the non-discipline data, the opportunity data is used and it helps you document patterns of inequality of opportunity. Be careful about using numbers when they are small. We give an example of a district in Pennsylvania where, where Black students traditionally have been referred to law enforcement in great numbers and even arrested in great numbers. And in this case, the district did turn in numbers, but it turned into number one or uh, that one Black, there was one Black student of the rest. Uh, so you know that that's not going to be a typical year for district. So, you know, you should not allow anyone to assume that the problem has gotten better over time. Um, for what data does exist where it is turned in, the discipline data indicates that the traditional patterns of disparate treatment by race, gender, and disability remain. Um, but what does this mean when so many of the large and more diverse districts with large numbers of students of color are not counted when it comes to their experiences with discipline. We have to be very careful about this. Uh, and again, it's important to use other equity measures reported in the CRDC where they do exist. So I wanna move on for just a quick second to what OCR, that is the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Education has concluded in its nationwide snapshots, which are available in the publications section of the website. So they do point to some of the trends of inequity that we know from previous years. And I'm not gonna read through all of it, but just a couple of points. We see black boys are nearly two times more likely than white boys to receive out of school suspensions or an expulsion. Students with disabilities represented 17% of enrollment K to 12, the 27% Referred to oh, those referred to law enforcement and 28% of students subjected to a school related arrest. Another uh, conclusion, set of conclusions drawn by the Office of Civil Rights has to do with the access to teachers and school staff. And here, uh, the data is more complete. And we find generally that many students, particularly students of color, did not have access to certified teachers and school counselors. And that is something that we want to highlight and we urge advocates to highlight in your local work, local and state level work. Uh, the Department of Ed also concluded that 7 million students attended a school with school law enforcement officers or a security guard, but without a school counselor. Again, that's an important point to emphasize in our work with the media and in our advocacy work globally. Now, this is going to be an understatement because of the missing data. So I wanna move on to just um, explaining another data reporting requirement. The Every Student Succeeds Act also requires local and state education agencies to report data. And I wanna take a look at that uh, requirement in just a minute. But first I want to explain that uh, the Department of Ed also has another collection, that is the Special Education Bureau also collects data on an annual basis. And I just want to give you a, like a, just a quick intro to this, but you can work your way through the links and see. Uh, the Department of Ed Special Education folks collect data on an annual basis. So this, is, this happens whether it's a COVID year, a non-COVID year, even in years in which there's no CRDC, uh, and there are tables, roughly about 20 tables that are collected um, collected every year and posted. Generally speaking, these are posted in a more timely fashion than the civil rights data collection. 
So what you will find there are things such as what happens to students with disabilities uh, with regard to discipline, suspension, expulsion, or in this case, in this particular example, we pulled up a spreadsheet for students who were suspended or expelled for more than 10 days by race and ethnicity. So you see, for example, in the state of Alabama, that 53.5% of the students who were suspended or expelled for longer than 10 days who are students with disabilities were Black. And so that is the kind of thing that you can find. But it's an incredibly rich database. It is not posted at the local level, but it does give you a state snapshot. And then finally, I want to say a little bit about the Every Student Succeeds Act reporting requirement. Under Every Student Succeeds Act, schools, local and state, are required to post data dashboards that are available to the public and do it on an annual basis, not on a CRDC cycle, but on an annual basis by December 31st of that year for the most recently completed school year. So if you say this, if you think that school year is normally completed in say June of 2023, then by December 31st, the state and local education agencies are supposed to have posted a dashboard with certain basic information about the schools and about what happens with students in that school by the end of that year. They can get a waiver from the Department of Ed from the Secretary of Education, but that waiver just moves the deadline. It, it still means that, that there is a reporting requirement. Um, and unfortunately, there is some confusion partly created by the U.S. Department of Education about whether the data, the most recent data has to be reported. Um, and that confusion was created in part because of sort of what the department said about uh, districts having, districts and states having the flexibility to report the most recently released CRDC data as opposed to the most recently acquired data. Uh, and that created some confusion. And so what you'll find in a lot of these dashboards is that some old data is reported. So they often take the data that was reported in the CRBC that was released when they have more recent data. But again, I urge people to advocate at the local level for districts and state education agencies to follow the requirements of Every Student Succeeds Act. And finally, Another source of confusion uh, has to do with what must be in those dashboards. And actually, the law is quite specific. Um, it has in it a statement, if you can go to the next slide, it has in it a statement of what must be reported. This is just an excerpt from the law. And you'll see in it, including rates of in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, school-related arrests, referrals to law enforcement, chronic absenteeism, and several other measures. Uh, we often find that the dashboards do not include school-related arrests and referrals to law enforcement, but the law actually requires that. And so we should get on these school districts and these state departments of education and make sure that they comply with the actual requirements of the law. And then finally, and I'm going to turn to our um, colleagues at the National Center for Youth Law, I just want to remind folks that there are actually data portals that are run by state departments of education or public instruction. And those data portals generally have annual data. And so you can typically find more recent data in those states that do have separate reporting systems. So I give two examples of California and the other one is Maryland. And as you see in the case of Maryland, that there is public school arrest data for the 2021-2022 school year, even though the CRDC is just beginning to collect that. And so that's just another example. So I want to turn to, I want to just finish by giving my contact information, then I'll turn to our colleagues at the National Center for Youth Law, uh, which can talk a little bit more about the state reporting requirements and what's available to the public from states. And so this is a good way to reach me. Uh, this is the website that we run, and there's a page on the website called Using Data, which has lots of information in it, including a template for requesting data. So I want to turn it to my colleagues at 
the National Center for Youth Law, uh, Sarah LaCour. Thank you so much, Harold. Um, we're gonna start off by sharing a map. Um, when you receive the PDF of these slides, these um, links are live to these 22 states that have released data since the OCR collection. So they have 2022 and in many cases, 2023 discipline data um, disaggregated by race and ethnicity, um, and in many cases by some other demographics. And we have a few few caveats about this. Um, we started this project a couple months ago, and even as we were checking links for this presentation, some of the previous links were now dead links. Um, so these were accurate as of yesterday. And it's also worth saying in some of these states where we don't yet have a link, um, we may be operating from an old link and they have migrated to a different page like the OCR data set did. Um, so we're seeing data through 2021, but there may be another page and we're continuing to search for those where more decent, more recent data reside. Um, but for those of you who are interested in these 22 states, you now can see the public facing um, data sets and you can explore those. In some cases, they have a dashboard um, in many cases where you can zoom in by school or district and see some visual displays of the data. And in other cases, it's a downloadable data set that you can review on your um, preferred platform. Um, and I'll pass it to Dan, who I believe is on our call. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Sarah. Um, also, just a shout out to the uh, data tools that um, Harold has developed on the N0, to N0 Tolerance website. Um, and including, we will also link to them because um, in addition, you know, we'll, we're going to discuss asking districts for their data, and we've created templates to do that. But um, much of what you'll see when you go to the, some of these state links may be uh, different ways of uh, calculating suspension rates that are different than what you'll find in this, the civil rights data collection. I don't have to get into those differences right now, but um, we are available as is Harold to uh, answer questions if you need some technical assistance. And I can put my email in the chat as well. Um, sometimes the differences that seem like they're not that important turn out to be, can describe a very different story and one that often is uh, more favorable to the district than you might see uh, in OCR data. The OCR data also includes something new, um, which are counts of days of lost instruction. The advantage to that kind of data, because they're counts of days and not of students who are suspended, is that there's no rounding, there's no redaction necessary. Um, so you can get some of the raw data that shows directly the impact of multiple suspensions. Um, and also because suspensions can vary in their length, uh, a suspension is not equal to another suspension if you don't think about that, the fact that one could be for one day and the other one could be for five days. So they're not necessarily uh, counting when you count suspensions or students suspended at least once. It tends to, uh, to make the disparities seem smaller um, because they're not capturing the full impact. So the days of lost instruction are very useful for that we often say it's a good idea to look at more than one way to calculate discipline data. Um, I think uh, Harold already pointed out that many states don't include the data on referral to law enforcement or school-based arrests. And, in, and even when the civil rights data collection happens and we look at the data, oftentimes there are zeros. Um, the other thing to keep in mind in when you're looking at data 
is that it's good to, if you can get the data on middle schools and high schools and look at it separately from elementary schools, um, that's important because the even though we hear about, pro and there are real problems with preschool suspensions and suspending little kids, um, it's still the case that in most districts, by far, the suspension rates are much, much greater at middle schools and high schools. And you can um, look at those together, which is what we've done in uh, this uh, slide is from an update to our report uh, where we did a deep dive into the California data that's available. Uh, and we downloaded the, the data sources on days of lost instruction. But the the thing about um, that Harold mentioned about not looking across years, you can look at both your state data and OCR data if you uh, omit the COVID years. The COVID years are the 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 years ending in, so 1920, so the year ending in 2020, because in that year is when schools began getting closed down. And then they were closed in most states and most districts for the entire entirety of the 2021 school year. So in this case, we have uh, gotten the data. So you can compare to earlier years and we do recommend it. Um, OCR has data from 2017-18. In California, they also collected and reported data from the 2018-19 school year, which is a good baseline comparison. And you'll see in our uh, in this report um, that we published, where we mined all the data from every district in California up through 21-22, that there was a huge increase post-COVID. And so that's in this district. In our most recent update, in the we have data now. We've uh, statewide analyzed the data for the 22-23 school year and saw for every racial group a small increase uh, compared to the year before. And in most cases, it was higher than it was pre-COVID. But for certain groups, it was extremely high, especially Black students who were the secondary level and Black students who were homeless or in the foster care program. We can go to the next slide. But that I do encourage looking at several years of data because it really helps understand, it. is this problem getting worse? But also if you're going to a school board, you wanna give credit if, they're, if the district has shown a reduction um, and that they're using data from before COVID and comparing it to post COVID data. Uh, so we already described the benefits from looking at uh, rates of lost instruction, which when you see data on counts of days, and these counts of days are also available in the special ed data that Harold mentioned earlier that are uh, available at the state level. And you can take the counts of days for any group and divide it by their enrollment and you get a rate of lost instruction. And that is something you can compare. Um, it's important, um, uh, let's see, I think we already went over this, so let's go to the next one. It's important though that, especially with regard to the civil rights data collection, so these are the data that include days of lost instruction, but it includes counts of students suspended at least one time, and they actually do publish, uh, uh, do provide, I think, suspension rates on that second point in the downloadable files. So you need, when you request from a district though, you want to make your request sometime between now and the end of April, because this is the window of collection for that first COVID year. And these data should be collected and available from every single district. So regardless, if, especially if you're in a state, there's not more recent state data and that's more than half the states, um, you should take time to put together a request to get the 21-22 civil rights data collection now. And we have provided, uh, Harold and I previously worked on this template that you can use and we've since updated it. Um, so in the template, it has, uh, there's, we really spell out in detail how to request the data, 
it references specifically the survey instrument. And without getting too much in the weeds, the point is you want to show the district that you know they have the data you're requesting and you know that they're re required to report it to the Office for Civil Rights. And that under most state Sunshine Act requests will prevent them from hiding the ball and saying, oh, we don't have it. Or you're asking, what do you mean? What kind of, so we, we in the template has all the precise language and the references you need to help overcome. Now, I know I saw Mar Marlon Tillman um, uh, was on the call. I know it's important to acknowledge that even when you do everything the right way, you still might get stonewalled by the district or they might try to charge you a lot of money. And so we're exploring ways to um, try to support uh, folks on the ground with maybe pro bono lawyers who are there. It's not established yet, but we are trying to, to, um, to address those problems. But it's also been the case in some states where the request goes through and they get everything. And, and when you do get the data, if you don't have folks who are part of your staff, you should contact us and we can do what we can to help you digest the data that you're able to get. So that's important. If you can go back, I think there's something in the prior slide um, that, uh, yes, so the, keep in mind that the days of loss instruction only go back to 2015, 16, but that means you can get 15, 16 and 17, 18 data, as well as 21, 22, which is post COVID not affected by COVID, at least not directly, you know, kids were in school is the point. Uh, and also the numbers of suspensions disaggregated by race. That's also fairly new. Um, so let's go two slides forward. I would say of one of the most important categories to request is the category of referrals to law enforcement and school-based arrests. But I also warn that you very well might be frustrated, but it's in, in that they might say, we don't have that data, the police have that data. And then, but it will be helpful as part of this movement to document their failure to comply with this data request. It is a major issue, and we've seen major, very large cities like New York City reporting zeros, and that's not just because of COVID. It, they have a long history of not reporting this data, and, and Harold has done an excellent job in Pennsylvania showing how some districts that reported zeros to OCR for this very same year did report arrests and referrals to law enforcement of school children when they reported to the state agency. So that's important to, to press them because this is an area of grave concern about racism, bigotry, um, and the disparate impact on kids of color, kids with disabilities, and it's being hidden you know, from our view in ways that, and school resources are often being expended to add police just when we really should be adding counselors and other student support staff. So it can also have a huge economic impact and drain resources that kids need. Um, let's see, We're in, when we're requesting, uh, yes. So it's on the N0 Tolerance website. Um, anything that I didn't get to, we can, uh, we wanna leave time for questions. So I think we're just about at the end. Oh, next steps. Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. I think we've covered most of these, um, but the point of getting, once you have the data, you can, it, there are some very standard ways, I call it fifth grade math, where if you, if you collect data, for example, in the CRDC, it has the numbers of students suspended once and then two or more times. You can combine those, combine kids with and without disabilities, you get a count of those kids suspended divided by their enrollment by the racial group. So black students who were suspended by black enrollment, and that gets you 
the suspension rate, the student suspension rate. And you can use that kind of information to prompt to file a civil rights complaint, uh, to bring it attention to the school board, seek your state attorney general to get uh, involved if there's glaring disparities. And um, it's also important, uh, the other point on the disability data that Harold referenced earlier, on the same website, you can, it's tricky, um, but there is, a, there is one um, data source that lists the states that have flagged districts where they, the, dis, the state said that the district had a very large racial disparity in discipline among kids with disabilities. So let me just say that again. On that um, IDEA data site, there's another um, uh, set of data where it can tell you whether in your state, and we'll name the district, if there are any districts where racial disparities and discipline among kids with disabilities has been flagged, that district's been flagged as having a problem, you can find that out. And that's often can be really important information to know. Um, if, especially if you're challenging that district for abuses, it may be they've already been identified by the state. Um, the other point is when their rates are high and the disparities are wide, to really focus on the groups that are most suspended and drill down and seek data on the reasons that kids are being suspended. Because oftentimes it is the, the most minor misconduct and the most subjective discipline categories that that is where we'll see the largest racial differences, the greatest contributions to the racial disparities. And those are policies and practices that should be eliminated. And certainly districts control whether or not they have policies and practices like that. So you can seek their elimination. You can also seek a reduction in the lost instructional time. So I'll end with that. Uh, and here are some additional links. Thanks so much, Dan and Sarah and Harold. Um, so I can add that additional link that you just mentioned around the list of districts flagged by each state um, into the PDF that we can share again. I think Lakita has put in the chat maybe a few times the, the PDF um, for the full presentation and all of these links are live, but we wanted to share, you know, just let you know that these are in there, all of our organizational websites, the links to that searchable portal we talked about that has some flawed data and some you might use, and also the overview of what the civil rights data collection is. It's that that page is technical, explains where all of the different years are at um, that may be useful to you as well. And then the ESSA report card link probably also has dead links, I'm gonna guess, but um, should link to each of the state uh, report cards and then the template to request the um, data that Dan and Harold were just going through. Um, and so we're perfectly on time, I think, to move into the Q&A. Um, so I think we can give some space first for you to ask the presenters questions. Um, but you can also think about if you have anything that you want to share, particularly on these three items, which I'll just go through. Have you lost access to data that you have previously relied on? Could be via the CRDC or other places. Have you used data recently in an effective way that you care to share? Um, and is there other data you know, that we need that we just don't have? Um, or maybe we think we don't have, but maybe somebody here knows that, that there is some way to access it. So um, I'm going to see first, I haven't been looking at the chat, um, see if there's any, okay. In regards to the COVID years, what data is available? I guess I think we kind of went through, well, we can give like a summary of this. In regards to the COVID years, what data is available? We know COVID exacerbated the conditions parents and students were already facing. Um, besides our family's testimony, what data can we use? So given all the flawed um, things that we just put forth and the burden of, of accessing data through these other sources, um, what else can you share about how to describe what is available about 
um, the COVID years or those specific COVID years. Do, do any of you want to take that one? So what did, can you just repeat the question one more time? Sorry. Sure. Um, in regards to the COVID years, what data is available? We know COVID exacerbated the conditions parents and students were already facing. Besides our family's testimony, what data can we use? So um, I could start. So there's data about participation in things like gifted and talented AP classes, which uh, even though schools didn't have in-person uh, instruction, many of those types of programs were still being offered and still very much um, large, we would see large, expect to see large differences in the opportunities uh, along lines of race and disability status. So it's good to, that that um, kind of information should not have been nearly as um, impacted by the lack of in-person instruction. So that's one area. Then you can't, there are, if you know that your district did not close down, then you can seek out your district's data for those COVID years, uh, not every single district in, you know, did close down. Many of them that did try to stay open though, did have to close at least temporarily. So it's still not a good idea to compare any data from either um, 1920, if it's on your state website, or uh, the data from OCR for the 2021 school year. It's not that the data can still be looked at on its own, and there may still be some evidence of racial disparities in who, you know, there are some reports of kids getting kicked out, you know, because of stuff that teachers saw on Zoom, even some arrests. So we know that there was still some degree of discipline going on in districts that just had online instruction, but is much reduced. So the big caution is that, you know, oftentimes when you have very low numbers, you know, it looks like um, it improved or that the racial disparities were much lower, but it's really just bad. You know, kids weren't in school. You can't get kicked out of school if you're not in school. There are two things I would add. Uh, one is just recall the example of Erie, Pennsylvania, where through data that we got uh, through the court system, we found out that um, school police were still issuing tickets to kids for truancy during the period of time of, of COVID closure. So that's a, you know, that tells you that there's a certain level of school discipline that was happening, which strikes me as actually quite bizarre, but that is true. The other thing that you should know is that even in cases where there is data provided in the CRDC for the 2020-21 school year, that data, at least in the discipline arena, may not capture the discipline meted out or sort of online infractions. Um, and in talking about this with the uh, Department of Ed, uh, they pointed out that the definitions of discipline uh, were arrived at uh, years before COVID. And so, you know, the definitions for the different discipline categories were not adjusted um, in the in the reporting court courts. And so if no one had anticipated at the point at which the forms were being developed for the CRDC for 2020, 2021 school year, it was not anticipated that this would be virtual discipline. So we know that a lot of the sort of suspensions and other things, other kinds of disciplinary actions that were issued due to sort of alleged violations of you know online protocols is not recorded in that data. Now, I actually think that it does make sense to 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 submit requests to school districts for that as well. But we're not gonna, we don't know that that's gonna be accurate either. But I would say. If I were looking at data from a COVID year, I would do a specific request apart from what's in the CRDC to the school district. And make it clear that that includes the suspensions and other disciplinary actions that are issued due to uh, alleged infractions 
uh, of the on during the online learning process. And I'll also add to DSE was working on compiling some of that type of data, like the individual experiences of of um yeah, like the virtual suspensions and all manner of things. So if you so I wouldn't discount, you know, the parent and student testimony. And if you do have that written up or in videos or, or notes or anything, um, you can send them my way and we can see if we can integrate that and in what we've been working on um, because at the end of the day, that is going to be where like the record of what happened. And as as we know, it, it's still having so many consequences for people now, for schools now. So I'm going to, um, um, Kim, you should be able to unmute yourself and then I'm gonna go to more uh, questions in the chat. Uh, good afternoon. Um I just want to know, in regard to understanding about suspensions, and we've been talking about this for a long time, where are we trying to get to um, in regard to our agenda, like even as a national movement? Um, because I would love to know where more districts are doing more RJ restorative practices. I know there are a few um, that even have, you know, schools where they actually are as a regular practice. Um, I, I would love to know how would we be able to get that kind of data where districts are doing well with trying to reduce um, suspensions. I think that's important as well as a model um, for people to know that it is happening somewhere. So that's where the lost days of instruction due to out of school suspension data is, is significant, where you can get that. Because, you know, what we're saying is that there should be sort of rare instances in which kids lose instruction. Uh, maybe no instances in which kids lose instruction uh, due to being removed from school. Even when they're removed from school, they should have instruction. And so that's the bottom line is that you don't want kids to be sort of permanently set back by any kind of disciplinary action, um, even when they're back in schools. So we want to, we obviously want to eliminate unnecessary out of school suspensions. We need to continue the efforts that have been mounted for many years in that area. But <clears throat> I think one of the ways to make the point effectively about the larger loss and the larger harm is to look at the days of lost instruction. Okay, I just wanna follow up because I know their chronic absenteeism has always been a problem, mm -hmm. right? We haven't, we haven't solved that part yet with just chronic absenteeism and how many days are attributed to school suspension, right? And we also don't know how often it is the same ch the child, right? Like one child could attribute to one school to have 20 suspensions and it's just that one kid. So the district would not probably count that as a problem, right? Because it's only one child being suspended out of the whole school. Yeah, so... So uh, it, it's hard uh, to... You know what I'm saying? Like when you're looking at this data and I know here we have an out of school suspension site so that the days are not counted. Even though you're suspended, you're actually reassigned to a school where you are getting instruction. Yeah, so th that brings up quite a few issues. So with regard to the sort of the one bad apple argument, we do hear that a lot. Um, it's often so raised when folks present, you know, concerns about racial disparities and high rates. Um, the advantage to the civil rights data collection uh, where they just count students once, um, even if they're suspended multiple times, you know, so you can combine students suspended only one time with sus students suspended more than once. You get a total count of students who are suspended at least once. And that's a very conservative metric, but it does answer that question. And if that rate is also high and racially disparate, 
and the days of lost instruction are. And they almost always go together. So rarely is it the case that it's really just the quote frequent flyers that are the cause of the racial disparities and the high rates. So, um, I'm not saying it's never, but it's unusual for that to really hold water. And you have other, so looking at more than one slice of the data, looking at the students, the, what we call the risk or the su student suspension rate, as well as the rate of lost instruction side by side will um, dispel that. You also raise the, the issue of referrals to alternative settings or to other schools. You know, moving schools, just like getting evicted, is an adverse childhood experience. And there's a lot of research to suggest that kids moving around a lot is not a good thing. So if, if a disciplinary exclusion is moving them from to some alternative school back to the sending school or some other school, this is not uh, conducive to healthy educational experience generally speaking. Um, there's a whole book about, you mentioned restorative practices or justice. Yes, that there's a lot of research to support that this is a, an excellent alternative. And, and not only does it not involve kicking the kids out of school, um, generally speaking, um, it also is a problem solving um, method. So the idea is that you're making the community whole from whatever happened, but also trying to get at the root of the problem so it doesn't reoccur. And that may include providing supports and constructive interventions for the, the student that whose misconduct was at the heart of the, the, you know, the restorative justice circle or whatever practice is involved. There's a lot more to it than that, of course, but it has shown to both reduce suspension rates and in some cases also uh, dramatically reduce the racial disparities. Thanks, Dan. I'm gonna to turn to um, some of the questions in the chat um, and then go to you, Anel. Uh, so one question is, I'm curious about the availability of data that zooms in on the reasons for disciplinary action. What infractions are leading to suspensions, referrals, arrests, et cetera? So we can start with that one. So uh, that question cannot be answered using the civil rights data collection. The civil rights data collection does not record the reason. It just records the numbers and the rates. It doesn't record the reason. Um, some of the state uh, databases and data portals actually do uh, have a reason and they're Typically, where that happens, it's tied to the uh, education code for that state. In other words, the categories for suspension that are in the education code. That's typically what you see in the state portals that have that, or they lump together a certain set of reasons. Um, uh, I would say that all local school districts actually have that information. They just don't automatically release it to the public. So that is a, a situation where you do want to fight with your district or, you know, go down way this loving if need be, <laughs> if you can, um, but to, to get that. So you do want to know why this is happening. Uh, there's a great body of research in this, uh, in this area where researchers have found that uh, a great degree of the racial disproportionality in discipline, especially when it comes to black students, has to do with things that are considered to be minor infractions, lower level infractions. Um, that's what the research shows. But those research studies that have been conducted have been for certain particular districts or for you know, X thousands of students. There is no uh, nationwide uh, summary research on this. Um, but we do know that they're from the, uh, you know, just the abundant research that's been done over the last 15 years, that the racial disproportionality is especially extreme in cases where state law does not require the kid to be removed from school. So you, there's no way to think about it. Most of the state laws that require kids to be removed from school were written in response to the Federal Gun Free School Act. And they may include reasons that are not gun related, but they're generally uh, infractions that are considered the most, to be the most dangerous or, or the ones that you know, are the most dangerous. 
uh, can include guns, could include string acts of violence. But what is striking about that is where that's been studied, what you find is that black students or, or tend to be heavy, most heavily overrepresented in categories of discipline that don't fall in those areas. In other words, so the largest discipline study ever done, let me break this down one more way, uh, which looks at a mil the records of a million Texas students over a six year period of time, finds that black students are disproportionately removed from school for infractions. They're not at the level of seriousness where the state law requires it. Right. And, and, and white kids were actually more likely to commit those other, to be removed for those most serious drug, I call it the drug guns violence categories. And that's a study of a million, the records of a million students in the state of Texas, which is quite right. remarkable. It runs against many of the public stereotypes. And I have found this to be the case in several districts where I was either a monitor or involved in an investigation. And it often uh, presenting this to the school board, um, you know, because of the prevalence of stereotypes and that are very harmful to kids of color. Uh, a lot of the assumptions are the, the that it must be the black kids, right, that are doing these worst offenses. When it turns out, it's actually much more likely in some of these districts that it was the white kids. And it's the black students are being kicked out of school for um, much more often for the other kinds of minor misconduct. And I always point out that in many districts, you can't get suspended for just being disruptive. So across the state of California, they eliminated that. And, you know, it, and we showed that in a lot of uh, middle schools and high schools and other researchers have shown that lowering the suspension rates actually correlates with higher achievement and improved graduation rates. So it is a win-win when we do it the right way. Thank you for that. And I'm also making notes of additional links that I can add to the PowerPoint and send out related to some of the stuff that you guys have brought up. Um, there was another a couple more questions in the chat, and then I'm going to do Anel and then Miss Ellen. Um, does anyone have a good go to place for Indiana data that is not on the map um, as having more updated uh, from the state? By any chance, <laughs> or any more, any any interactions that you've had at the state level for Indiana? I am not an Indiana specialist, but I would say that there have actually been a number of good um, media reports where um, some investigative reporters have gotten a hold of the data. Um, I think it's. Public radio, was it W? Yeah. Public radio has been very good. There's a particular reporter uh, based in Indianapolis uh, at the public radio station there and the public media station there who's been very good about, very aggressive about getting data uh, for Indiana. Thank you for that. Um, Anel, you should be able to unmute yourself, I think. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, my question is around uh, virtual schools transitions. Um, so I'm from Student Advocacy Center in Michigan. What we're seeing in Michigan is that a lot of students are being transitioned into virtual schools as a alternative to suspensions or expulsions, mainly expulsions. I think what we've also seen has, in regards to that, what we've seen is that school districts will tell a family. Uh, uh, now you're breaking out. Um, will tell a family in order to, instead of expelling you, I go. And so is there any, is there any like talks about collecting data around that? Because we're finding that it's very challenging to um, collect data or, or, or see the data on the number of students that are being transitioned into virtual learning academies or virtual learning programs, um, even if that's due to, I mean, for whatever reason, we're, we're, we're not, like, I've, what I'm understanding that our state isn't really collecting some of that data. 
Um, and also, is are there any conversations around what funding around that could look like as well? Because there's this per pupil dollar amount that um, going to a virtual school is obviously a lot cheaper, right, than in-person learning. And so students, what we're seeing is that schools are still um, looking at per people dollars the same as virtual programs that they are for in-person learning options. Um, so just just curious about if there are any any talks about that or anywhere that we can find any of that information. I think you've hit a real major concern that um, I can't say that uh, I have a sense of what's going on nationally, but I have seen this phenomenon even before COVID in Michigan in uh it was east, I think it eastern, east of Detroit, there was a district that looked like they had dramatically reduced the racial disparities and lowered suspension rates at the secondary level. And it's the one that had been featured by NPR for having these flip schools where kids would get uh, online education at home and then they come into school and work with the teacher supposedly a great thing but it turned out that most of the black kids were being sent to this virtual school which had no suspensions because the kids weren't in school but they were getting a very substandard education it was all virtual they weren't in school and it was had these the virtual school had very 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 low graduation rates um, across the board and it was dismal yet they were being you know trumpeting their flip school model and how great it was. And it looked on paper like they had dramatically reduced suspension rates. So the, the virtual schools within that are run by districts can complement, complicate things. The same district was also in under investigation for possible fraud in um, how it was spending its education dollars. It was under, investigate, under investigation by the... Uh, I believe the state attorney general. Um, I'm not sure exactly the details on that or or how it wound up. Maybe, Anel, you can tell us. But I am worried about this issue because so many virtual schools were started by districts during COVID. I worry that some may be maintained by districts and looked upon as sort of substandard education cash cow, but they can look good on, make them look good on paper. Thank you. I don't have any additional information on that. It, it is, like, like you said, just very concerning for what we're seeing for our students and getting a quality education. Um, again, like you said, like it's, it's, we're seeing that a lot of students are coming out of virtual programs with a lack of skills and those kind of things that could be enhanced if with in-person learning options. So thank and you. you are you in Michigan? Yep, we're in southeastern Michigan. Okay. I'd like to follow up with you and find out more. I can connect you guys offline. Um, and if anybody else wants to be connected to any of the speakers or anybody who's brought something up, you can just reach out to me directly. I think my email should be the one um, connected to your registration for today. Um, Ms. Ellen? Thank you. Thank you all. This has really been interesting. Um, so this is my question. How, where does data for young people going into the youth court system, then for Mississippi, it would be a detention center where they should be receiving education. Who who's tracking that data? How does that fit into what um, OCR may or may not be? Well, first the district is collecting and then OCR, that's one question all around, you know, how do we track those young people going in and coming out of that system? Then I guess the second question, Dan or Harold, this is for you. In Mississippi, I've been invited to speak on this Mississippi Advisory Committee to the US Civil Rights Commission. What is that? Do they have any kind of um, role in collecting data? What's their whole purpose? Can either of you tell me that? Yes, I can answer the second question because okay. uh, I have some familiarity with that. So for a very long period of time, uh, each state under the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, there was a state advisory committee on different topics. Sometimes it could be on gender discrimination. Uh, sometimes it's on other things. But 
I would say roughly 10 states. The advisory commission uh, has done report, maybe about eight states, has produced reports on school discipline. Uh, Pennsylvania is one of them, and I actually testified and been quoted in the final, testified at the hearing and quoted in the report. So this is an advisory group that is at the state level. Um, it doesn't have any legal force. However, it can be used, uh, can be useful in highlighting an issue and in getting the attention of other state and local officials. So for example, in Pennsylvania, there is a report on school discipline that was compiled, not based on research, but based on the testimony and other information, not based on original resource, research by the advisory commission, but basically compiled by the staff uh, of, of the Civil Rights Commission uh, based in part on the testimony before in those hearings. And so in the Pennsylvania one, there's something like a 150 page report, but there's a 10 page section in there that really comes from my testimony and materials that I submitted. So I think it's, you know, as a as a sort of PR tool and as a way of bringing attention, calling attention to a problem, say the state officials, legislators, uh, departments of ed, I think having these the problems that you're seeing in the state documented in that advisory commission for a court is a very smart thing to do. And to your question about the juvenile justice, uh, kids in the juvenile justice system and their education and how, so both in, the, there's clearly issues with how that the enrollment is recorded because the enrollment in the OCR data is uh, as of a date in October, who was enrolled in the district. So that might include students that are also currently serving time in the juvenile justice system. So there's always been a question about the enrollment of kids in those juvenile justice schools and where they're assigned for the reporting purposes. And the same is true of their discipline. Um, uh, many, uh, the, I don't have any faith that the, the education provided in to kids who are incarcerated is of a decent quality. And we hear a lot of horror stories uh, about kids, you know, being put on computer systems and earning credits and being told as they try to return to the high school that none of those credits transfer. So, and, but also that kids get kicked out or not allowed to attend classes for behavior, but it's not reported as an out of school suspension since the school and the, is in, you know, the, the, uh, institution and the kids are living in this in the same place or they just don't bother reporting and no one cares same thing with uh, referrals to law enforcement you know it takes on a different meeting if your teachers are law, law enforcement so um it, there are some problems with getting an accurate read but i don't that you know i message sarah that we'll we'll try to to mine there is data there is a flag in the crdc for schools that are part of the juvenile justice system. And oftentimes we put them to the side because of the huge variety of weird data that we see coming out of those places. Um, but it is important not to continue to overlook them. So thanks for, you know, calling attention to that. We have another question in the chat and you know, we have until 3.30. So if anybody wants to um, add another question to the chat or respond to any of the questions that I have here for our participants around how you've used data, I meant to say this in the beginning, you could just send me a direct um, message if you want the question to be anonymous. And you can also, if you want to ask me to um, pause recording, if you want to ask a question. Um, that way, and then I can restart it when we're finished. So just to put that out there. Um, so another question was, what guidance do you all have for organizations doing nationwide state-by-state -state analysis of discipline data given reliability concerns? Uh, 
try this question again. Can you repeat the question again? What guidance do you have um, up there for people who are trying to do the nationwide state by state uh, data analysis about discipline data? Given all of the concerns that you all have shared, if people are trying to do that, like generally, I guess, summarize some of what you would say. Sounds like maybe the person's trying to put together a report or a presentation or something like that, that looks at all the state data. I mean, we at the, the National Center for Youth Law, before I was um, uh, came here, um, I through the uh, Center for Civil Rights Remedies at UCLA, I produced several national reports and one that you can use as a baseline, which is has data on kids with and without disabilities, disaggregated by race, by uh, grade configuration. So you can see K-12, but you can also see elementary uh, rates separate and from secondary rates. There's suspension, the, the, the more conservative student suspension rate, but there's also the rates of lost instruction. And that's for every district in the United States for the 17, 18 school year. So using that as a baseline, it's important to see um, whether rates are going up or down, but I wouldn't use the CRDC data for that kind of comparison because unless you file a FOIA request for a certain district for the more recent data that is post COVID. So that's just to reiterate the points that Harold and others were making about that um, there is um, also a concern when you do state comparisons, like we did not include state comparisons of referrals to law enforcement or school-based arrests. Why? Because Los, for several years, Los Angeles had zeros, New York City had zeros, Chicago was reporting zeros, Philadelphia. So if your largest city in your and other large districts in your state are reporting zeros that we know aren't true, then it could make a certain state look like it has a low level and and maybe very little racial disparity in this area, which could be the opposite of the truth. And so given when we see um, serious issues with the quality of the data, um, either in large districts or sometimes the whole state, uh, we've detected problems in Florida and one year in Ohio, where there was just a widespread error, um, you know, so we would, we remove states like that. So you have to be wary of reading too much into data, especially when it's, it's contrary to what you know from experience or contact with folks with boots on the ground. Um, so that's one sort of caveat. I can go on and on. So I'll stop there, but uh, you should contact me because I, you know, if you're, planning to do something, I can either help you or maybe something that we're already engaged in uh, creating and there's no point in reinventing the wheel. Maybe we can collaborate and join forces. So, so I, I would say two things. Doing a nationwide analysis using the civil data collection, which you know, apart from the Department of Ed special ed collection is the only national collection. You know. Uh, it's the only national data set. I don't think it's for the faint of heart. And I would not do that unless you have significant research capacity. It's not something your average organization should do. Uh, so I, I would advise against that unless you really have some serious research capacity. Uh, the second thing is that uh, there are ways to look, there are other ways to look at na national trends. Uh, for example, the Department of Ed produces what are called uh, sort of nationwide estimations, sort of state and nation of estimations. Uh, they don't have one for the 2021, but they do have it for other uh, CRDCs. So for example, I'm going to give you a link to it. It's on the site. Uh, there's the state and national tables that, that include enrollment, uh, preschool enrollment, school programs, who's in gifted it. And, and for each of these categories, uh, it has state by state rates uh, by different uh, categories. They are downloadable as um, CSV or Excel files, but that includes school staff, discipline, et cetera, restraint and seclusion. 
where the government has consolidated that into Tavix. So here's the link for the page on their website for the state and national estimations, the tables for 2017-18 in school. And you could go to a particular category, um, say a particular subcategory of school discipline, click through and generate a table. It's a, a table that you can download that includes the rates by state. It could be the rates by state by gender, the rates by state by gender and race, the race and state gender and race disability. Those tables are there where the government has taken the CRDC. They've taken the raw data, not the data that is privacy protected or around it, but they've taken the raw data and come up with these state and national estimation. So you can work with those. You're trying to uh, you know, come up with some trends that comparing one state to another. They have not attempted to do that, uh, to my knowledge, in the 2020, 21 school year data. But for all of the other civil rights data collections, at least in recent, in the past decade or so, you will find that thing. Thanks for your question. And it sounds like um, Dan and or Harold would be available for some like technical questions that you may have around that if you're working on um, something specific. Um, I think that might have been the last question in the chat. Does anybody else want to um, raise their hand or give an example of any of the other things that I've posed around what data we need? Some things have already been brought up around, for example, um, stats on like on the use of the positive alternatives like RJ. Um, we talked about um, the virtual schools uh, instead of expulsions, but just in general, the detention center education rates are some areas that we identified needing additional data. Um, Ms. Ellen? Yes, I wonder, Kim had put a comment or a question kind of in the chat. I wonder if Dan or Harold saw it and could respond to that. It's around, um, discipline data do you see it Let, let's see can you all see the kim are you still there and can raise your question or comment that you put in the Is chat this about detention yeah i mentioned that you know discipline data and detention data is two different things because detention has to do with unfortunately as someone going to court and being you know Convicted so of something, and now do you mean? Are you referring to kids that go into the juvenile system? That detention, not yeah. being detained at school, isn't it? Okay. What that's all that, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so someone asked that question. I, I was mentioning, I was describing how the civil rights data collection includes suspension oh, data yeah. for the kids in those places, and also so a, a lot of other data points about that reflects on you know their school climate in those detention facilities but how i don't trust it because oftentimes you know there's zeros across the board it's either they're not reporting or it's you know what what does it mean to be in get an out of school suspension they might say well we don't do out of school suspensions because the kids can't leave <laughs> They live here. Um, There's a couple but of things. The schools up. don't, we don't operate detention centers. So I'm just trying to, maybe I'm getting confused about the conversation. Let, let me, let me, let me express it a different way. Uh, when kids are removed from school, uh, several, there are several pathways. One pathway is to be put into a place that's an alternative program you know, which is either run by or funded by the school district, even if it's a private provider, that's not a prison. That's not necessarily, you know, part of, you know, automatically part of the incarceration system. But, you know, kids that are expelled are typically placed in that, those kinds of programs, so alternative programs. And there is data available on that. It's supposed to be in the civil rights data collection as well. Uh, I have questions about the reliability of that, but many states also collect that kind of data. So that's a transfer to alternative disciplinary programs. 
if a kid is formally enters the juvenile justice system as a result, in most instances, of school-based arrest, that's the juvenile system. And that's what we refer to as juvenile detention. And that, for the most part, is not going to be captured in the civil rights data collection. Uh, you would have to go take a look at the data that is collected on the juvenile justice system in that state to whatever mechanism there is. So in, in Pennsylvania, right. there is a state commission that monitors the functioning of the juvenile justice system. We can most likely get some numbers on what happens to kids who are formally removed from school districts and placed into the justice system as a, a result of the school-based arrest. But that's a totally different system. Right, and I, I do think that for clarity, we have to think about in school suspension, out of school suspension, and then expulsions are di different because uh, you're completely kicked out of a school system when you are expelled from school. Yeah, so the, it's an interesting thing. So, depending on the district, the reliability of the expulsion data is also can be very questionable. And it, and it <clears throat> depends on your state. Like North Carolina, that's those are the tiers that we deal with. Yeah. So it you really. You know, we could have a discussion about how to accurately capture it. I'm I don't claim to be um have great expertise on the expulsion data. Part of the reason that we typically have not reported on expulsions is that they are usually very low in number. Um and often districts, large districts report zeros. Part of the reason is that in some even the kids who are referred or to law enforcement or subjected to arrest for the school-based misconduct, um, they may not get expelled. They might wind up having a longer term a, a suspension, or they may be regarded as a transfer to a discipl disciplinary, alternative disciplinary placement. And how that's reported, it's a question, but there is independently data on those transfer rates that we can calculate. And in some school districts, they're very, very high and very problematic. Um, and um, it's it's complicated, but. The, the general takeaway from this though, is if a kid is involved with the justice system as a result of a, something that happens in schools, that's the answer to, Finding out what happens and the rates and is going to be very state specific. It depends on the relationship between the schools and the justice system in that state. Once the kid leaves the jurisdiction of the school district, doesn't mean it's it doesn't so matter. Oh, but it it really depends on how these systems are organized in your state. Yeah. And the other thing is a lot of times the students are there for only a portion of the school year. Often it's, you know, and we want them back in the mainstream. Um, so the idea of calculate like capturing graduation rates or looking at uh, achievement levels in those schools gets also um, confounded by the fact that they're, they may not be assigned to those schools for reporting purposes for the CRDC, but maybe they appear in some other database as attending or enrolled in a juvenile justice run school. So, Well, thank you so much um, to everybody who attended and for these wonderful questions. Thank you to our speakers, our panelists, um, Dan Lawson and Sarah LaCour from the National Center for Youth Law, Harold Jordan from the ACLU of Pennsylvania. I have been taking very detailed notes and the chat has a bunch of examples of resources um, that we can link to. Basically, I'll just create um, a couple more slides that have the answers to the questions that we may be able to um, gather more info where we didn't have a immediate answer. And so you can look for, um, I'll send it to all the registrants, a new updated PDF that has a couple additional pages. Um, and we are gonna upload this on YouTube. So you'll be able to also um, watch it later or share it with other folks um, that may benefit from it and come back to it when you all are are filling out your Sunshine Act request and um, trying to make sense of things. So 
Thank you again to our panelists and to everybody for coming um, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you Thanks, all. Everybody. It was great. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good, good information. Thank you. Yeah.